The lesson of the hour is a lesson that is difficult to accept, though very plain and clear in the pages of the scripture. I not only have a son, but I have a daughter who has become unfaithful to the Lord. And one of the most difficult things that we as a congregation have done, and me personally, was to withdraw fellowship from my daughter and my son-in-law. I realize as we begin to study this afternoon that though we know the truth, oftentimes we think that the truth doesn't apply to everybody in the same sort of way. I'm sure that part of the reason why we think that way is because of the emotional ties that we have to our family and to our friends. But there are very few exceptions given in the pages of God's word with regard to how we are to treat some people as opposed to treating our family and friends. And I think as we proceed this afternoon, we'll see that, whether we accept it to the point of applying it to our lives is going to be up to us. But I think we can see from the scriptures that the truth applies to one and to all. The statement of our lesson, the title of our lesson, is rather lengthy. How are the faithful to deal with Christian family members and close friends who remain in fellowship? It says erring brethren, but error could be applied there. And so we want to look at the pages of God's word to get God's answer to that question. It really matters not what I think about the situation or what you think the situation ought to be. The reality is it matters what God has said. And then, knowing what God has said, we have an obligation to accept it if we're going to be faithful ourselves to the Lord. And we also need to realize that if we reject the truth, we are no longer faithful to the Lord ourselves. And so I want us to begin this afternoon in Matthew chapter 12. It is a passage to which Brother Brewer referred to us earlier this afternoon. I'm going to start in chapter 12, then I'm going to go back to the passage in chapter 10 that Brother Brewer talked about. Let's start in chapter 12, verses 46 and following. While he had talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak to him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Listen to these questions. Who is my mother? Who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Now we've all read that passage before. And we read that passage and we understand that that's an indication here that Jesus had some half-brothers and references made in Mark chapter 6 to even sisters. And he also had a mother. And certainly of all of those people that we live with and grow up with, some of the most fond memories 
the close association cannot be equaled with that which we have with our mothers. And Jesus in the flesh had those feelings, I'm sure. He loved his mother and he loved his brethren. But when we look at this passage in reality, we learn something about the relative importance of even these close relationships that we enjoy compared to the spiritual relationships that we should enjoy. Jesus asked the question, who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he might have said, who are my close friends? And then he answers the question. He says that his real mother and his real brethren are those that do the Father's will. As important as those inter-family relationships are in the physical families of which we're all a part, there is something more important or should be more important to us than even those close family relationships. And that is the spiritual relationship that we enjoy with all of those who do the Father's will. Jesus is teaching us that even those family relationships that are so fondly looked upon are secondary to the relationships that we enjoy as we all do the Father's will. I remember growing up early on in my exposure to the church where it was almost always done that we referred to one another as brother and sister. We don't do that much anymore. We may call the preacher brother so-and-so, but I like that. The fact that we call each other brothers and sisters is a reminder concerning the fact that the most important relationships that we have here on this earth is being a brother and a sister to others of like precious faith who do the Father's will. Now I'm not talking about disrespecting fathers or mothers or sisters or brethren. I'm talking about the fact that we need to understand that the most important relationships that we have on this earth is with those who are brothers and sisters because we do the Father's will. And Jesus says here, by implication, that as important as my mother is and as important as my brethren are, it is more important to do the Father's will. In other words, he wasn't willing to give his mother and his brethren special audience on this occasion because he was more interested at that time and continued to be in emphasizing the importance of every one of his disciples to do the Father's will, to be obedient to God. Without, listen, without respect of persons, even when it means people in our own families. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, Paul said, but if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house, the household, the family of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. So one thing that we need to emphasize in our relationship with one another is that we're part of a spiritual family that is more important than even the physical families of which we're part. I don't know that I can overemphasize that fact. 
When we think about obligation before God, we need to think about the obligation to do the Father's will as the number one most important thing that a human being can do. And it is that motivation, that doing the Father's will, that ought to be that tie that binds us together. And we ought not to allow anyone or anything hinder us in our pursuit of obedience to God's word and working together with others who are doing the Father's will. Then if we go to the passage that Brother Brewer mentioned in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus makes again some references to family members. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 34, he says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance, now listen, at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Now let that sink in. I remember when I first decided to preach the gospel. My parents were members of the church. Had been as long as I can remember that they always attended, always were members of the Lord's church. But my parents were opposed to me preaching the gospel. And I had to make a decision. Am I going to please my parents? And let me mention here, I think they were primarily concerned with the way in which they knew that I would be treated over the years and didn't want me to be treated that way. But I had to make a decision at that point in my life whether I was going to serve the Lord and do what the Lord wanted me to do or listen to my parents and not do it. I'm thankful to God that I decided to preach the gospel. Sometimes the biggest hindrances that we have to doing what is right and good in the sight of God comes from those within our own physical families. And we need to be aware of the fact that there is an obligation that we all have to do what God says in his word for us to do, whether we have family members who are pulling us away from that idea or not, our obligation is the same. You know, Job wasn't the only one who had a family member that wanted him to do something that was contrary to the will of God. His wife telling him to curse God and die. And so Jesus says here, of all of those that might influence you away from the truth and cause division and keep us from doing what God wants us to do may very well come from our family. In fact, he says, a man's foes shall be they of his own household. And so Jesus says again, I didn't come to bring peace and harmony within families because sometimes family members, some of them are going to be obedient to the truth and sometimes other family members are not going to be obedient to the truth and they're going to do everything that they humanly can do to prevent faithful service to God. A few verses earlier, in Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 21, Jesus says to his apostles, And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father of the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. 
And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. So the most important relationship we have in this life, in terms of human beings, is not the relationship that we have with physical families, as important as they are. The most important relationship we have on the face of this earth is with our spiritual family. Brothers and sisters in Christ who are doing the will of God. Yesterday, when I stood before you, we were looking together at the things that Jesus said to one of those churches of Asia. And he began this letter by describing himself as being this two-edged sword that cuts both ways. In fact, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 16, he introduces himself and he says, Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And then again in Revelation 2 and verse 12, these things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. And then when he comes to the conclusion of his letter to the church at Pergamum, in Revelation 2 and verse 16, he says, Repent, or else I come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Being a two-edged sword, it cuts two ways. It convicts man of sin, also of righteousness. That same sword converts some and condemns others. It saves all who accept it and slays all who reject it. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17, Paul, in talking about the whole armor of God, reminds us that we need to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And sometimes that sword cuts one way and then the other. It condemns those who reject that Word, and it defends those who accept it. And so there is that matter of fellowship and false teachers. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11, Paul said, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Let me say that he did not say, Have no Fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, unless it might be members of your own family or close friends. I don't see anything in this passage that would indicate to us that if those people under consideration happen to be part of our physical family, we ought to ignore the need and the necessity, the obligation to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Now I understand that there are some family obligations that have to be carried out, but we're talking about spiritual fellowship. And if we didn't know that before, if we didn't know what fellowship was before this weekend started, we should know what fellowship involves now. But there's no exemption in that passage that indicates special treatment different from the treatment that is given in the situation of false teachers or error when our family members or close friends are involved. Nothing like that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul makes it clear 
that there is to be a distinction between those who are faithful to him and those who are not. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17, he says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Now listen to this. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. He's not talking about family members, physical family members. He's talking about when we separate ourselves from the world, the sin of the world, we become sons and daughters of God and therefore brothers and sisters to each other in the spiritual family of God. And that's a whole lot more important than any physical tie that we might enjoy. Being a son or daughter of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 12, Paul says, Do not ye judge them that are within. He didn't say, Do... Do not ye judge them that are within except for family members who can get by with every sin imaginable and be overlooked. It applies across the board. Brother Dub McClish wrote a number of articles back in 1998 or thereabouts that I carried in Matters of the Faith in which he emphasized the application of Revelation chapter 18 and verse 4, where we read these words. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye may be partakers, not be partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plague. Come forth, my people. Sever your relationship with sin. I think Brother McLeish said that he ran the similar article in the Gospel Journal under the title, Good People in Bad Places, or something like that. Bad Churches. We've talked about this already this weekend, how that we have an obligation to be selective about those with whom we have regular fellowship and the importance of being part of a congregation that is faithful to the Lord. And we cannot, we cannot allow physical family members to prevent our doing what is right. We cannot have respect of persons in the application of God's word. There are certain things that are difficult for us to do. Not because we don't understand them, but difficult for us to do because of the emotionalism that's involved in some of these things. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, God says to Jeremiah, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth, See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms. Now listen to what he's supposed to do. To root out, to pull down, and to destroy, and to throw down. There are certain negative things that have to take place before the seed, the word of God, can grow and bring forth fruit. You've got to cultivate the soil. You've got to pull out the weeds. And sow that seed in honest and good hearts, it will bring forth fruit. And he says, continuing in that passage, to build and to plant. In 2 John, we've read this a number of times this weekend. Verse 9 and following. Whosoever transgresseth, and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and Son. 
If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, that is the doctrine of Christ, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Partaker of his evil deeds. I, I remember back in 2005 there was a lot of discussion about what the opponents of the truth were saying that we were trying to push upon the brotherhood A to Z fellowship. And 2 John verses 9 through 11 doesn't teach A to Z fellowship, but it says that if we endorse in any way somebody that's treating the truth with disregard, we become a partaker of his evil deeds. We become the, a sinner and are subject to withdrawal of fellowship as long as we persist in giving God's speed to those that teach error. And I remember the use of the term during those early days of this departure I'm referring to a buddyhood instead of fellowship. And the implication of that term was that we were, or some, were willing to apply the truth generally, but when it became part of our buddyhood, we refused to apply the truth to them. And they're still doing it. That's exactly what they're doing. They are showing respect to persons because they are close friends of theirs or their family members or their financial benefactors. And they are saying by their deeds that the truth doesn't apply to them as it applies to the rest of us. And it wasn't so then and it ain't so now. We are told repeatedly in the pages of the scripture that God is no respecter of persons. In terms of our lesson this afternoon, that means that God is not going to give special, a special dispensation to someone who is a member of my family and then treat somebody else who is not a member of my family in a different way by a different standard. Does that make sense? God is not going to save one person because he's a member of my family in spite of the fact that he has refused to repent of his sin and then save somebody else on a different basis or a different plan. I keep coming back to the same idea that God does not have separate plans for the church generally and then a different plan for me and my family or my close friends. The word of God applies to one and to all without respect of person. And that's not only a quality of God, the absence of respect of persons. It ought to be a characteristic of every child of God. Listen to James in James chapter 2 and verse 9. But if ye have respect of persons, isn't that what we're talking about this afternoon? If ye have respect of persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. When we're willing to overlook the sins of our family or our buddies, our close friends, the reality is we're showing respect to persons and James, through the inspiration, by the way, James is probably the half-brother of Jesus. James, through inspiration, says we sin when we do that. Is it going to be easy? 
No, it seems like it's going to be difficult because it has to do with that sword. And swords can hurt. And if we desire to go to heaven, we're going to have to yield ourselves to the word and, and the will of God and be obedient to him, do his will, and apply that word without respect of persons to everyone else too. I guess the bottom line is this. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 29, Peter said to the Sanhedrin, we ought to obey God rather than men. That's the bottom line, isn't it? No matter what others might say, no matter what others might try to do to stop it, we have an obligation and ought to obey God rather than men. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21, Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. That's what salvation is all about. If we desire to be saved, we're going to have to be obedient to the word of God. Not giving exemptions where God is not given exemptions, but rather applying the word of God as God teaches it in his word. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6, the Apostle Paul talks about withdrawing fellowship. And listen to what he says and how universal that application is. He says, now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, now listen, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother, that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. Every. Universal. Without exception. Not paying special favors to our brethren in the flesh. Our family members. Our buddyhood. But rather every brother that walketh disorderly. And not after the tradition that is after the word of God. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, Jesus said, Seek ye first, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. Friend, that's our obligation, to seek the kingdom first, without respect of persons doing all that God has commanded us. That's what we need to do. Thank you.